Is there anything that you recommend for curtailing that withdrawal sensation? Well, you know, withdrawal is, uh, can be extremely painful. So mindfulness practices or prayer practices can be very helpful to allow us to just sit and tolerate the pain and watch it come and go, kind of surfing the urge, so to speak. Uh, reaching out to other people, maybe buddies with whom you're doing the dopamine fast, or if you're involved in 12-step recovery, calling your sponsor or going to a meeting, so touching base with another human. Mm -hmm. um, and I also recommend hormetic practices. These are doing something that's more painful than the pain of withdrawal, yes. like putting your face in an ice-cold water bath, doing 20 sit-ups, getting yourself outside, um, forcing yourself to connect with others even if you don't feel like it to kind of get ourselves out of that sort of withdrawal spiral. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, um, kind of pushing on that pain when right. you're in pain. Right. It seems counterintuitive, right? Yeah, it is really counterintuitive, but from the perspective of that pleasure-pain balance, when mm -hmm. we press on the, the pain side intentionally, those gremlins will hop over onto the pleasure side and we will get our dopamine indirectly. When you're in a dopamine deficient state and in withdrawal. Actually, even without being or in period, dopamine, sorry, yeah, just but, in general. But in the context of a withdrawal state, yeah, potentially, you know, you mentioned mindfulness, um, community makes a lot right. of sense. But then, if you push on the pain side, yeah. then you'll get maybe a dopamine quote unquote fix when you're in a deficient withdrawal state. Yes, and there are lots of experiments showing that when people are in withdrawal from a significant uh, addiction. Uh, that exercise will mitigate symptoms of withdrawal mm. and speed up recovery Excellent. and decrease risk of relapse. Awesome. Excellent. Um, and then you mentioned cold face, face yes. in, face in cold water. Cold, uh, plunge is huge right now. Yeah. What's your take on it? Well, you know, it's a little bit like drug of choice for some people. It's going to be extremely effective mm -hmm. to help sort of reset reward pathways and give them a surge of indirect dopamine. But for others, it may not work at all. So it really kind of depends on the person, but certainly worth trying. Yeah. And then, you know, in regards to because this is another strategy that you have in, in, in addition to the do dopamine fasting is pursuing pain. Right. So pressing right. on that pain side cold um uh the cold plunge is one thing which increases dopamine and, and in a sustained fashion yeah. for uh greater than or at about one hour after you get out of the mm -hmm. the cold plunge yes. is that right mm -hmm. um which is definitely a way of doing that from from a, a pain perspective um you know and then so then i wonder when you push on pain you increase dopamine but a point that you made that I thought was interesting in the book was the dopamine that you receive secondary to pushing on pain um, is different than the dopamine you would receive from a line of coke or, you know, some sort of illicit substance that would do it from from sort of an external source. Is that right? Well, I mean, it's 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 all dopamine. Right. Um, and obviously, again, this is kind of an oversimplification of a very complex brain process. But. What happens when you get your dopamine indirectly uh, by doing some eff something effortful or hard up front is that you never go into that dopamine deficit state. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you get your dopamine immediately by using an intoxicant of some sort, that's followed by the come down, which is that right. dopamine deficit state. And that's 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 what drives cravings to reuse. Right. right. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. go ahead. So, yeah. So you don't get that. So what happens with drugs is that we don't get a sense of like satiety from it, yeah. right? We, we get a sense of wanting to do that again and again and again, uh, which if we, uh, you know, succumb to that craving, which, you know, we're very vulnerable, all of us to do that, um, that then we're, we find ourselves in that spiral of addiction. Whereas getting dopamine indirectly by doing something hard up front, um, it's, it renews itself without that dopamine deficit state. And every time we have to do that hard thing, it's, it's, it's equally hard. Again, you know, we, we have a very poor memory actually uh, for the initial, uh, for the, the downward, the downstream effects of the stimulus. We have an excellent memory for the stimulus itself, whether mm -hmm. pleasure or pain, but we're not very good at remembering what comes on the heels of pleasure and pain. Right. So we have to remind ourselves. Yeah. So is this, dopamine more persistent after pushing on the pain side um do you get it in 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 you know a little bit at a time 
versus you know drugs it's kind of like this burst of dopamine would that be the difference between the two or is it not that well i mean the typically the the dopamine that we get through effortful engagement is not all that long lived mm. right mm -hmm. so i mean for example our endogenous endorphins or endogenous opioids that get released with exercise that then cause the cascade that ultimately releases dopamine. I mean, endogenous opioids last on the order of minutes. They, mm -hmm. they don't last very long. Yeah. So, but, but the point is that we were really evolved. Our pleasure pain balance evolved for us to have to work hard up front to get a very transitory small release of dopamine, mm -hmm. which then allows us to go back to homeostasis and be receptive to changes in our environment because our survival depends on being receptive to the constantly changing environment. Mm -hmm. Whereas what happens with modern intoxicants, which have been made incredibly potent and long lasting is we get a huge sur surge of dopamine, at least in the initial exposure state um, that can last much longer um, then our brains were really evolved for, mm -hmm. followed then by this stream, extreme compensatory mechanism where we plunge into that kind of dopamine deficit state. So th that's the problem, you know, with uh, modern intoxicants. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, a, it's a surge of dopamine with minimal effort um, such that it's like a fire hose of dopamine that we're then, you know, our poor brains are sort of helpless. Right. Um, in response. Yeah. And Have you recognized or do you know of any sort of effortful task up front that increases dopamine to the level of, you know, some of these other shortcuts like illicit drugs and things like that? I mean, it's, it's hard to really quantify uh, dopamine levels in the human brain. Sure. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, unlike in the rat studies where we can actually put a probe mm -hmm. in the nucleus accumbens and measure dopamine levels. You know, we can't do that yeah. in humans. Um, we have imaging studies, but those are based on, you know, relative comparisons. So it, it's difficult to get those data. But my suspicion is that um, that anything that releases dopamine, a lot of dopamine all at once in our brains is going to be something that's ultimately going to be dangerous right. for us. So that, that's inherently why pushing on pain and pushing past pain is beneficial is because it doesn't release as much dopamine as, you know, some illicit drug or some other um, addiction. Would. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's at the level that our brains can tolerate. Can I will say yeah. though that you don't want to, I don't think pushing past pain that, you know, you still want to listen to the body's signals. You don't want too much pain mm. because if you, uh, you know, if you expose yourself to so much pain, especially during a physical activity that you injure the body, then you're not in that nice hormetic window. Yeah. I forget to get the benefits of that. It needs to be not too little, but also not too much. Right. So for example, we're not talking about self cutting. Yeah. Self cutting does release endogenous endorphins and uh, release dopamine, but it very quickly depletes itself such that, um, you know, it doesn't work with repeated exposure right. and it, you know, it's, it's causing tissue damage. So that that's not what we want. Yeah. That's an interesting point because you can get addicted to certain exercises yes. or certain, you know, um, self injurious behavior, yes. things that cause pain. And we see that. We see addiction to self injury. Yeah. We see addiction to exercise. And so then the intervention becomes um, a fasting from that behavior, right? Yeah. Not engaging in exercise for a period of time, um, not engaging in cutting for a period of time, and really conceptualizing those as addictions. Right, and intervening there in the same way that we would intervene uh, when people are addicted to drugs and alcohol. Yeah, very interesting. Mm -hmm. 